Now let's talk about work because uh, we seem to have a worker shortage these days. Won't, I mean, isn't there, a, isn't there a, a silver lining on this cloud that these migrants will at least fill some of the vacant jobs in Australia at the moment? Yeah, look, they will to an extent. Uh, there's a massive job shortage. There's about 450,000 job vacancies across the country. That's about double what it was pre-COVID. Um, and about one in four businesses can't get the workers they need. So if you're walking down your, you know, your local shops, uh, you go past the chemist, the butcher, the supermarket, the cafe, the pub, you know, one in four of those shops or um, you know, uh, cafes that you go past, they can't get enough workers. They can't find the people they need to get the job done. Uh, and that's putting upward pressure on prices and causing delays and so forth. So there is a big job shortage. But we have a solution right in front of us, uh, which is uh, pensioners, veterans and students. I mean, if we just look at pensioners, they face enormous financial disincentives and red tape from working. Um, if you earn just $226 a week as a pensioner, thereafter, you're taxed at 50 cents on the dollar in terms of losing your, your welfare payments. So only three out of 100 pensioners in Australia work compared to 25% in New Zealand, which doesn't have the same barriers over there. So government, uh, again, has missed an opportunity. Yes, you know, migration can fill some of the, the skill shortages, but we need to be looking closer to home and removing these barriers to our own uh, people getting the jobs uh, you know, where that's appropriate. Well, let's talk about the, what used to be the opposition. We call it the Liberal Party. I had a former grassroots member of the Liberal Party on the show last week talking about why he and others have had enough of the factionalism in the party. Now, you and I and our viewers know how much damage our coast-to-coast -coast Labor governments are causing the country at the moment, but they are getting away with it because the Liberals and Nationals are in disarray. Dan, what do you think can be done about this? Well, I think there's a couple of things. Um, I think firstly, at the federal level, they're starting to take up the fight a little bit. We've seen some good moves uh, opposing the voice to parliament at the Liberal, both the federal Liberal and national parties have a clear view on that, which means there'll be a debate on that. So I think that there's uh, you know, some positive developments uh, at the federal level. At the state level, it, it is still in, in very much uh, you know, lacking that kind of leadership. Um, I think that the, the Labor governments, certainly at the federal level, are very vulnerable. Um, Albanese is much more like Whitlam than he is like Hawke. Uh, Whitlam was a very sectional type figure. Um, he was personally popular for a while, but his government was never that popular. Remember, Whitlam only won by a few seats. Uh, and then three years later, he was gone. Um, and then they had another eight years of coalition rule. I think Albanese is very vulnerable. If you look at what he's pushing, the voice, a republic, uh, you know, the migration that we've talked about, um, various other economic policies. These are fairly radical changes to our way of life that most Australians don't want and that most Australians didn't vote for, even those who did vote for Labor. Many of them do not want these kind of policies in place. So, look, I think that there's a big opportunity politically at the national level, um, you know, and, and, you know, as we sort of see this develop, I, you know, hope there's more of a debate on these issues. Well, the way things are at the moment, if Albo is the new Gough Whitlam, the only way we're going to get rid of him is if we have another Sir John Kerr.